welcome to the afternoon meeting of the Vermont House Education Committee meeting. Um, we are continuing our discussion on the COVID-19 response and we have a variety of people here from, speaking to us from the field as to what's going on. Um, I spoke briefly with Mill Moore the other day. I'm happy to have him here today. So Mill and, and Ed Nasta. Um, Mill, why don't you go first as the executive director of the Vermont Independent Schools Association? And I understand this is primarily related to special education. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Webb, for welcoming me and members of the, the committee uh, for your attention here this afternoon. Uh, I just want to make a quick observation that I, I uh, this is certainly not my first teleconference in the last few days. Uh, I've looked at several online from state government. I've also participated in others with other groups for other reasons. Uh, figuring out things as we go along seems to be uh, a remarkable talent here in Vermont. Uh, we're moving it very rapidly toward adapting to this extraordinary situation that we're in. Uh, it's working uh, reasonably well, I think. Uh, so I am Mill Moore, Executive Director of the Vermont Independent Schools Association. And yes, I am here today to talk about special education in the special education only independent schools. We held a teleconference amongst the heads of many of those schools a few days ago. I wrote a brief summary of that meeting and forwarded it to the two education committees. And that was the impetus for my uh, being invited to be here today to, to brief you on what is being observed out there in the field amongst these schools, of which are 32 in Vermont, enrolling roughly 800 students. These are all students who are, are quite disabled. Uh, their disabilities are so serious that they can't stay in their uh, former local school. So they have been sent to a school that specializes in the disabilities that they have. Uh, adaptation to the, the COVID-19 school closings and uh, distance learning developments has been really challenging for these schools. Uh, the school heads tell me that many of them were skeptical at the very beginning that a distance learning approach would work, but uh, their skepticism has been proven at least partly mistaken. Uh, things are working to some extent, but as you might imagine, there are some problems and I, I want to address some of those. First, I'm going to talk about the problems that they're experiencing from the student point of view, and then I'll turn to the, the school's point of view. Um, the, uh, the main problems are getting in communication with schools, uh, with students' homes. Uh, internet access, as everybody I think understands, is limited in some regions of Vermont. In some regions, it's not even present at all. Uh, some households cannot afford internet service or the electronic equipment that goes with it, the laptops or iPads or so forth. Uh, I listened back on Friday uh, when Erin McGuire testified to your committee. And I remember clearly she stressed how important is family cooperation with a distance learning approach for students with disabilities. But family cooperation isn't always possible for a couple of important reasons. One might be that the family members are essential workers. They're out of the house. Or second, uh, and this is really uh, very important, is some families are very fragile and students are part of that fragility. So reaching them is really important uh, and they are very hard to reach because uh, even if they do have inter internet connections or telephone connections, uh, sometimes there's no cooperation in actually making the contact. So those are all equity sort of issues tied up with the new medium of remote communication. Uh, the schools themselves, um, as you might imagine, are worried about revenue, retaining staff, sustaining their business models and uh, uh, moving into uh, their programs that they have scheduled for the summer. Many uh, independent special ed only schools have summer programs that are vital to their revenue streams for the entire year. Uh, at this point, nobody really knows, I don't think uh, how that's gonna shape up. Uh, 
So that, that's very much on their minds. Uh, remember that these schools are all administratively independent, but they are wholly dependent on public education funds that flow through supervisory unions uh, to sustain the special education services that they're providing. So they're in, they're in an anomalous situation in that respect. Uh, they do have some concerns about the extent to which they're going to be relieved of regulatory requirements that have to be met in ordinary times, like uh, upcoming reviews and approvals. A bulletin just came out today, hours ago, uh, from the Agency of Education saying, don't worry about that, we got you covered. So that, that concern has just been relieved. Uh, I'm delighted to see that. It, it was a very logical thing for the agency and the State Board of Education to agree to. Uh, the schools are also concerned that as these new instructional techniques and, and new uh, media are introduced, that they be forgiven or uh, helped if requirements for confidentiality and other boundary issues are inadvertently or even necessarily breached. I think Ed Masta, when, who's, when he speaks later, can probably talk about specifics of that. And these schools need some understanding of the circumstances unique in the work that they're doing. The fragility of their students that I mentioned, the very narrow constraints in ordinary times within federal and state rules for how special education is conducted, and the very detailed reporting requirements that prevail in normal times. So we're now getting information about the uh, federal and state supports that are going to be available for small business. Uh, I expect that uh, that will be very helpful in relieving some of the survival concerns that these schools have, but uh, we don't have enough detail on that yet. I do know also that the Agency of Education is very aware of the equity challenges involved in delivery of special ed anywhere, not just in these schools. And I do expect that we're going to hear more from the agency as time goes on and as they have opportunities to, to get down to these more specific issues. So that's all I have in the way of reporting right now, uh, Madam Chair, and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, and then you can move on and hear from Ed Nasta. Thank you. I, um, I have not seen the new guidance that came from the AOE, did it, but I did hear that it was out. And, and um, I know we're certainly looking to see what kind of relief we got from the federal government in relation to um, even just things like the paperwork yeah. <laughs> requirements. Um, so thank you. Um, questions for Mill before we go on to add. Peter. Uh, thanks. Um, Something that came up when we were talking with uh, Laura Sores of the Vermont School Board's uh, Insurance Trust was about um, reimbursable unemployment benefits. I'm assuming most of the independent schools, um, especially special ed schools, are nonprofits that probably use an uh, unemployment reimbursement model as opposed to being part of unemployment insurance. And I'm just curious if you've given that any thought or if that's a factor. I have not given that any thought myself. I'm sure that the, that the schools themselves are looking very closely at that. I know the Labor Department has started to put out bulletins um, in that area, uh, as well as the Agency of Commerce. And I know that uh, just, I know that, uh, uh, you know, there's probably not going to be widespread layoffs in the independent schools because they still need to be in business. And it's the same thing with public schools. Uh, but the concern was folks who have, may have left employment and then get subsequently laid off from another job and the look back and what the impact might be. And uh, independent schools are not part of the um, part of VISBIT, are they? I, for property and liability that's, and all that. That's a question, I guess, for Ed better than me. I don't know okay. the answer to that specifically. Let me just touch on one thing, though, that came up in our conversation a few days ago, and that was... Uh, that uh, reimbursement to these schools is, is or has been under normal, normal circumstances based on contact time. But under this new system of the distance learning, we've got uh, fewer hours of contact time and contact people are fewer. But that doesn't mean that, that 
there are a bunch of superfluous people all of a sudden because preparation of materials now uh, is more time consuming. And so that there's a lot more background work that's going on. And so the, the employees that are doing that need to be sustained as well. And I think that realization will filter through the pro process and it, those people will be covered. But it's just, that's an example of the kind of small details that mean a lot uh, if they're not handled. And that might be something that could be handled. Um, as opposed to the reimbursement that. model. I'm just, well, it's just an aside wondering if, if some of those uh, challenges will be removed once we move from a reimbursement model to a census-based model. Um, that will not work because it appears that the census-based model will not be applied to independent schools. That was a judgment made by the agency a few months ago. Yeah. And that's before the, the panel, I believe. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, you know what, Serena, I'm going to... Uh, and Larry, I'm thinking maybe what would help is if we could get Ed in and then we can direct questions to both Ed and, and Mill. Does that seem okay? Okay. Uh, and good then, afternoon, then, folks. Sorry, You'll have the first. Go ahead, please. Sorry. So I'm Ed Nast. I'm the executive director of the New School of Montpelier. Uh, New School of Montpelier is uh, one of those schools that Mill was referring to, uh, independent uh, um, approved school for special education only. So all our students come to us from the sending school districts, the LEAs uh, on IEPs, and um, they've been found to have disabilities and challenges to the extent that the public schools have not been able to, to serve them uh, adequately. Um, so in terms of you know the continuum of disabilities, um, the children that we serve are at the far end of the continuum in terms of the more intensive needs, children with um, classic autism and you know severe emotional disturbance and um, you know different trauma backgrounds and and often uh, multiple disabilities. So um, you know that said. Um, you know, we have about 30 some odd, odd students that, you know, we've been serving successfully for, for quite a while. And with the you know, governor's order, we actually have done some pretty amazing work over the past couple of weeks that um, I'm, I'm surprised we've been able to do as well as we have in terms of setting up distance learning and being available to our students and, um, and really trying to offer a, as much contact and as, as much learning opportunity as, as possible. Um, there are impediments. Um, some of them are technological in terms of, um, you know, some of our families do not have internet access or have some compromise in, in that, that regard. Um, you know, the, the circumstances put a lot of stress on families because um, you know an adult needs to be available by and large to um, help ensure that the student is accessing the technology and, and participating in instruction. Um, I am you know fairly confident that moving forward we will have the capability to provide a, a full day worth of instruction. Uh, again, the limiting factors are availability of, of students and and um, adults in the household to you know to help with that that participation. And you know, even under the best of circumstances, um, you know, it's going to be somewhat compromised due to the fact that you know we don't have face-to-face -face contact with the with the students and it it limits the, you know, the possibilities of, of what we can do. So, um, you know, certainly we will commit to, you know, whatever we need to commit to in terms of continuing education. Um, I am concerned about uh, some of the guidance that came out from the Institute of Education just this afternoon. Um, 
there's uh, guidance that's entitled guidance for approved independent schools, including residential facilities during COVID-19. And under the caption tuition reimbursement, um, I'll just read you a few of the sentences that um, really caused me a lot of concern. Uh, it says an LEA, which is the local sending school district, will not be required to reimburse an approved independent school for special education services that are not or cannot be substantially delivered during the period of school closure. Independent schools may receive reimbursement from an LEA for the delivery of compensatory services if determined necessary for a student's IEP team upon the return to school subject to the availability of funds for this purpose. So in, you know, in, you know, part of the special education regulation allows for IEP teams to decide on whether there's a need for compensatory services if there's a disruption in the, the typical delivery of services. So that would be sort of after the fact, after schools are back in regular operation, IEP teams would meet and decide whether there's um, there was a level of regression or loss of skills that would require additional special education service. So that's sort of an after the fact way to um, address some of the um, instruction that uh, students might be missing out on in the immediate, um, you know, foreseeable future in terms of moving to a distance learning platform and, and trying to offer uh, the special ed services that we can. The way this reads, it, it really is concerning. And I've already emailed Deb Ormsby, who is listed as the contact, because if in fact they're going to say, well, we're not providing the level of service that we would typically do, and they're not going to pay us, you know, the full tuition for our regular program, it really, um, it, that's a problem in terms of, you know, making business decisions around staffing and um, um, cash flow and, and, and revenue projections. So um, this, is, this is the first day that I've seen anything that really speaks to that. And uh, I'm hoping that there's some amendment that uh, allows for a little more flexibility because that, that does put us at risk as a business and, and as an organization. Okay, great. Tracy, at some point, might want to chat with you about that as well. Um, Sarita, you had a question. Um, I'm wondering if this um, situation provides um, schools, independent schools throughout the state to collaborate and coordinate um, services or resources or staff now that people won't have to drive, that you could do it remotely? Uh, you know, I think, you know, with um, Mills leadership, certainly the independent schools have, um, you know, met several times and have been collaborating, um, you know, both um, online and, and through email. Um, you know, there's a weekly, um, meeting for those of us who are um, special ed only independent schools. I, I think we're all trying to share ideas. There's been a ton of collaboration around resources and, and it's quite amazing, quite frankly, you know, the online resources in terms of delivering curriculum online that, that are available. So that, you know, those are all good things. We're all learning and becoming, um, you know, more competent with using online curriculum and, and, and getting more comfortable with, you know, having meetings and, and providing instruction online. So those are all good things that actually would, you know, bode well for education in general in, in, in the future. I think, um, you know, if I could speak for um, a lot of us, certainly the, um, there are concerns about funding, um, you know, whether we're profit or nonprofit, and we happen to be a for-profit um, school, um, you know, 
funding, you know, reliable funding is, is critical. And um, unless the school districts get assurances that they're going to get their special ed reimbursement, LEAs are, are not gonna make the commitment to continue paying their tuition to the independent special ed schools. So, you know, that, uh, you know that's, a, that's a big one. Um, some of the other things that Mill had mentioned earlier, um, I do worry about the stress on parents. Um, you know, some of these kids have significant behavioral issues um, or communication issues. It's going to be a long haul um, over the next 10 weeks for, you know, parents, you know, to, to have these kids sequestered in their, in their homes. So I do worry about how much we can expect from parents in terms of assisting with instruction. In terms of confidentiality, um, there are platforms, um, and I believe Zoom is one of them, that is uh, FERPA and HIPAA compliant, and we've researched those, and we are only using platforms that are compliant with the confidentiality um, regulations. And we do um, traditionally offer a five-week summer program and, and, and obviously that's in, in question at the moment as well, dependent on, you know, how things progress in, um, in relation to the virus. Um, so, you know, it, you know, part of it is part of what's been, you know, a challenge for me at least as an administrator of the, of the, of the school and having 60 some odd employees is just, the unpredictability of, of all this and and the, you know some of the guidance has been contradictory and and just a little bit difficult to decipher but we're in a better place now in terms of offering program for all our students and and certainly um, I'm ready to commit to providing a full day's worth of instruction I can't guarantee that all our students are going to be willing or able to um, access that instruction. Thank you. Good to see you. Representative James. Unmute. There you go. Sorry, I thought I hit the button. Um, Ed, just ask a, a district specific question. Um, how would I, I'm concerned about the reimbursement question that you raised and how that might impact um, a school like Burn Burton Academy there in my district. Can you fill me in a little bit more on that, please? Uh, could you could you elaborate on that just a bit uh, so I can understand? Yeah, I was understanding um, Ed to be saying that uh, independent schools, according to the guidance that was uh, released by the AOE today would be uh, perhaps not reimbursed in full, but only partially for special education services that were delivered remotely during this closure time. And because Burn Burton is in my district, I'm wondering how that might impact, um, you know, some of our academy schools like BBA. Um, I, can't, I can't comment yet because I've just scanned that document once very briefly. I think maybe Ed is in the same position I am. Uh, plus, we're waiting to hear back from the question he sent to the agency. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah. In, if, if you read this one sentence of guidance, you know, as it's stated, an LEA will not be required to reimburse an approved independent school for special education services that are not or cannot be substantially delivered during the period of school closure. So in my mind, by definition, you know, we can't provide what we had been providing um, because we can't have, you know, face-to-face -face contact with our, our students. So, you know, either they need to define it better or again, I, I would hope that they would be a, a little more liberal um, given the context that we're working in and it would affect Burn Burton because Burn Burton does provide special ed services to some of their students. Yep. All right. Uh, thanks for getting that on on uh, our radar. Yeah. No, I, it's an important one, and I just I'm I'm shocked, quite frankly, that they would, you know, maybe they need to reword it, but it's um, 
you know, if you if you if you read it literally, it's it's not good news for us. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> you just have to use the little hand, <laughs> Larry. <laughs> I'm trying to get you ready for the floor. <laughs> um, I, I don't have a little hand. I, <laughs> there's not one there. So, uh, Milt, I have a question, if if uh, if you don't mind, and it relates to one of the paragraphs where you <clears throat> say the schools need clear guidance and assurances on, uh, or no, that's not the one. It's it's about the 175 day school year requirement and possible extensions of the school year. Can you expand on that? The agency has now answered those questions uh, just in the last uh, couple of rounds of memos coming out. Uh, so I feel much more comfortable about those now than I did uh, when we had that conference and when I wrote that summary. We'll get that, we'll get that document up. I, I, I saw that it went through, I have not read it yet. Mill, actually, if you would say, save a little time and maybe send that document to um, Avery, then we'll get it posted on our website I'm as well. I'm happy to do so. Yes, it's still unclear, uh, as Ed said, about what, what we're gonna be doing in the summer, but yeah. at least we, we're, we're beginning to get some clarity about the 175 day school year requirement. Right, the compensatory education 175 days, correct. Yes. Okay, um, I think, uh, Peter, you have a question. I do. Um, uh, Ed, it sounds like a little bit of the problem you're describing is that, uh, as you said in your testimony, you can't guarantee that every student will avail themselves of the remote learning services that you're offering, yet your business model counts on reimbursement for providing services to those children. So that seems to be a, a difficult balancing act if, if they're not taking advantage of the services, therefore you're not providing them, therefore you're not necessarily entitled to a reimbursement. Um, but I guess, so that's just acknowledging perhaps a challenging problem to wade through. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, if you're not providing services to a, a student, the responsibility for, to fulfill the IEP contract is really on the LEA. Uh, am I correct with that? You're correct that the LEA is ultimately responsible for the provision of IEP services. They essentially contract with us to implement the IEP that they write. So that that, that is correct. And as a practical matter, um, I, I don't believe the LEAs want to suddenly take on the responsibility of yeah. trying to provide IEP services for these students because for one, you know, I'm not sure that they have the capacity, you know, these students have been out of district in some cases for multiple years. The LEA teachers don't really know the students. And um, I, you know, I would not, I, I would suspect that, um, you know, they would want us to do everything that you know, that we can to provide the services. And I have reached out to each of the LEAs that we work with that have sent students to us. And unanimously, they were grateful for everything that we're doing. They wanted us to continue. Sorry, is that me doing that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, and they said unequivocally that, um, you know, there's no problem. They would honor their contracts and full tuition uh, up and through April 6th, and beyond that, they were non-committal, um, waiting on guidance from the AOE. And, and again, that's why I'm so concerned about this guidance that the AOE put out, um, because, um, you know, my interpretation is that that um, means that there's going to be some uh, you know, significant comp compromise about um, what the LEAs are going to be authorized to, um, you know, compensate us. And, and, you know, your question about, so even if we're prepared and ready and able to provide the services, 
by virtue of the fact that the student isn't accessing them, you know, what, what does that, what does that mean in this context? Um, because as Mill, you know, referred to earlier, um, there is a lot of preparation that's going into this and, um, you know, teachers are spending their time maybe doing different things. It's, it's not meaning that there's, you know, less time needed to deliver this type of instruction. I guess just to follow up, it would seem that it's not really in anybody's interest to see this crisis cause failure within the within the special and only independent schools, because you're clearly providing a service that um, they have that public schools have sought out or LEAs have sought out. And, you know, a absolutely. So I think it's you know, it, you know, if in fact the AOE is is taking you know, that kind of position that we really don't matter. I think it's very short-sighted and I do think there will be a major backlash from LEAs and parents and IEP teams um, because we wouldn't have these students um, and unless, you know, we were needed as, as a service. And, and I'm speaking, I mean, I've been working as a private school administrator for, you know, a little over two years now, but the majority of my professional career has been in the public schools as a special ed administrator and as a school principal. And, you know, I, I know the dynamics of trying to provide for some of these kids. And, um, you know, there are times when you need and, and legally need a continuum of placements uh, because some kids just cannot be served. And, you know, part of our goal for all of our students is a reintegration plan to try to get kids back to a less restrictive environment. But, you know, that's, you know, that takes, you know, months, if not years to, to actualize. Um, so, you know, we're part of the big system <laughs> and we're all sort of interconnected as Mill said. Um, so, you know, we just want to, I want to make sure that people are aware that, um, you know, at some point we're going to be back in regular business and, People still need us. Well, I want to thank you very much for bringing in this perspective. I think one of the things that this crisis has uh, definitely helped us do is begin to uncover some of the weaknesses and right. inequities and vulnerabilities in the system. And here is definitely definitely another one uh, that we will be looking looking into. Um, I appreciate getting the copy of, of the guidance so we can take a look at that and follow up with the AOE. Uh, we certainly know that um, the agency is, is, is working as fast as they can and working with, with folks to uh, uh, forth them. There are times that maybe guidance needs to be pulled back and reviewed, and we will we'll hear from them um, next week, I believe. Um, yeah, thank you. What I'd like that. to do now, okay. We'll do one more from uh, Representative Elder, and then I want to move on to the um, other public school advocates. So, um, Representative Elder. Thank you. Just briefly, um, curious if the new guidance answered any questions or clarified anything in terms of um, compliance for districts more generally with special ed. I know that we had heard um, some questions about that from Aaron McGuire on Friday, uh, just whether certain IEP guidelines or rules could be met. Um, and I'm just curious whether, because I know it's an issue of having revenues go to the, um, to the independent programs as you've been talking about, but also I was concerned about liabilities or problems with revenues generally from um, the federal level to local to districts. And so I'm just curious, do you, do you know if, if there was helpful clarification in, in today's guidance? I think what that would probably be better directed to Tracy um, because she's involved in, in, the, in this more broadly to include all of the public schools. So I know Tracy, you were gonna speak to us. Um, do you wanna just keep that? Do you, do you, did you have anything planned that you were gonna say? Yeah, I was gonna give an update, which- um... Okay. So, so let's, if you can hold that question on, on your update, that would be great. Um, because I, I think that that's an important question. And um, 
I want to thank um, Mill and Ed very much for being with us. You're more than welcome to stay on, or you can watch it on, on YouTube. Either is fine. Um, we are going to hear from the school boards, the principals, the council of special ed uh, administrators, the NEA, and the superintendents um, next. And really, I think what the focus is, and I've spoken, spoken with them, and they've agreed, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> to speak with us on a weekly basis to basically give us um, in this during this period of time where things seem to be changing so rapidly to just give us what are the key learnings this week that you have each uh, uncovered. And in addition to that, what are things that we could do for you either statutorily or through, through funding um, that will inform or guide us as we move through this current situation as well as preparing for the future. So um, I, I, we'll, we really need to hear from you as we try to sort out what our role in this process is. So um, I'd like to start with Sue from the school boards. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sue. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to give you an update. And it's good to see all of you. I'm just going to give you uh, a brief update on what's happening with Vermont school boards. Um, as you all probably know, Governor Scott signed into law yesterday H-681, um, which, which the House voted on last week, and um, it establishes temporary election provisions and temporary changes to the open meeting law during the state of emergency, and that's something that um, we have been focusing on this week. Um, the temporary election provisions are going to be very important for the districts that haven't voted on their budgets yet or and those districts that uh, had their budgets defeated during the first vote. There are nine, um, according to my count, there are nine um, budgets that were defeated um, on town meeting day and there are nine districts that have not voted yet on their budget. So those 18 districts um, or 18 budgets will need to be um, voted on. And um, just to go over briefly the temporary elections provisions that should hopefully um, help with that process. Um, one of the changes is that during the state of emergency, people who are running for school board don't have to um, collect signatures on a petition in order to get their name on the ballot. Um, another provision has to do with um, temporary elections procedures. The Secretary of State is authorized to permit um, procedures that protect the health, safety, and welfare of voters, elections, workers, and candidates. And some of the ways that are uh, that is allowed to be done is by requiring mail balloting, requiring town clerks to send ballots by mail to all registered voters, creating early and mail ballot collection stations, permitting municipal clerks to process and begin counting ballots in a 30-day window preceding the day of the election, permitting drive-up car window collection of ballots by election officials, extending the time for municipal clerks to process and count ballots and extending voting hours on the day of the election. Um, and then another change is uh, allows any municipality to apply the Australian ballot system to any of its municipal elections held in the year 2020 by vote of its legislative body. Normally that would be a vote, a vote that would have to happen at an annual or special meeting of the municipality, but this is a um, special provision just for 2020, which will allow Australian balloting to occur in uh, places that it ha wasn't uh, previously voted on by the municipality. So we are thankful that these uh, temporary position, uh, provisions are gonna provide some flexibility for uh, how school board elections and school budget votes can occur. And um, we're sending out a legislative report to member boards today, notifying them of these changes and plan to notify the specific boards that are affected. Um, as I mentioned earlier, those who have not voted on budgets yet or those whose budgets were defeated um, in, uh, so that they um, have the information available to them to be able to make uh, decisions at a local level as to how they're going to proceed. 
Um, the second thing that we've been focusing on are the temporary open open meeting law changes. I think you're probably familiar with those. It um, eliminated the requirement for a designated physical meeting location. There's some um, requirements for public access to those electronic meetings and um, a requirement that meetings be recorded, which is something new for school boards. So we're getting that information out to them and also preparing some guidance on um, how to conduct electronic meetings. Um, there, it's kind of new territory for most school boards, um, especially it is new territory if they're, they're all doing it. Um, because in the past, there always had to be a physical location for, for the public to attend. Uh, I think that's, that is our, those have been our two main areas of focus so far this week. It is only Tuesday, so I'm sure we're going to be um, having a, a lot of other areas as well. But um, I think one of the things that I've heard from uh, multiple committees um, at the legislature wanting to know about um, the school district budget votes. I think that's a big area of concern. So um, I'm happy to see if there are any um, school board chairs of that uh, are boards that still need to vote on their budget that uh, would like to testify and um, let you know about any concerns that they have. Um, I'm happy to do that if you would like to hear from them directly. I think so. I think uh, particularly in relation to the testimony that we're going to be, the discussion that we're going to be having on Thursday with the Ways and Means Committee, um, I think there is great concern about what, what is happening with the districts that don't have a budget. Uh, what happens if you don't have a budget by June 30th? Um, there are definitely some concerns there. There's also will be questions that I'm sure will be asked related to should all votes happen at the same time? Um, should uh, all um, municipalities collect taxes at the same time for school boards? Mm -hmm. um, since we have 125 million that's still outstanding for 2020. Right. So, um, but would people like to hear from a couple of those school districts that are, that are struggling? that don't have, um, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Uh, perhaps we could do that uh, Tuesday morning, uh, Thursday morning, excuse me. We have okay, to see what I can do. Yeah, and, and if we can't do it then, then, then um, I don't know if there's gonna be time, maybe there'll be time Thursday afternoon when we're doing, when we're meeting with um, Ways and Means, that could be another possibility. Actually, that might even be better time. So um, Representative James, you have a question of Sue. Just a quick question. Um, just coincidentally earlier today, I had received a question um, asking whether there'd been any conversation about extending that June 30 deadline. That's us. <laughs> that will be part of the conversation. Um, in statute right now, it says um, that school districts can borrow up to 87% of last year's budget and where they borrow from, I've since learned, is the bank. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Is that your understanding, Sue? Yes. Okay. So that's an us thing, not an AOE thing. Yeah. That will be part of what we'll be talking about with um, ways and means. Great. Thanks. So there is something that <laughs> we can play a role. Um, okay, so if you could hang in there, the questions might come back that, that you could answer. Um, I'll stay on. Let's go to Jay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I will keep it much more brief than the other day. You got to hear my impassioned uh, plea the other day, so I'll keep it much simpler today, much shorter anyway. And then yeah. answer. So we want to hear what's happening from the field. Um, and you know, what, what, what's new this, what's new this week? Well, new since the last time I talked to you is, is not a lot. It's a lot of the same stuff. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that, you know, the, the AOE is putting out a continuity of learning plan 
and the superintendents have been working with them and I was invited in on that conversation and perhaps Jeff will talk more about that when, when he, Jeff Francis, when he's on. But I think the key is that we have to make sure that whatever we do is doable. And um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dilbert, but uh, I'm reminded <laughs> of Dilbert, there's uh, Wally, the real lazy guy. And uh, one of the other workers walks up to Wally and says, you know, I'm a pragmatist. I really like plans that are implementable that can be done. And Wally says, well, I don't like those plans at all. I want them to be very elaborate and, and really look good on paper, and not be something that can actually be done because it's a lot easier. And I think we need to make sure that we stay in the realm of what can be done. And I think you've heard that message from me repeatedly. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're working with the AOE and others to make sure that we put out plans that, that are implementable, that can be done. The natural inclination by educators, including myself, uh, is to try to meet and do everything and meet every standard and think that, okay, we're just because we're not in school anymore, we can do everything that we're normally going to do. And that's not the case. It's not possible. We need to focus on some priorities in terms of instruction and uh, academics. We need to say, okay, what are the two or three most important priorities for this grade level, maybe in this content area that we want to make sure kids have a better understanding of by the end of the year, especially given that many kids will not have direct instruction from their teachers. Um, I've also heard comments, uh, I know Ed mentioned today about full day of instruction and other people. It's not going to be realistic for kids to have a full day of instruction unless they've got somebody there providing the full day of instruction to them. So I think we need to be careful about that. I really believe a student should not be required to be online more than a couple hours a day independently. If there's ways to do things synchronistically where all the kids have access to the internet and those types of things, then that's fine. But we got to remember, a lot of kids don't have access to the internet. Um, as I testified to you the other day, and in many cases, when they do have it, they've got a college sibling at home is trying to use it. They got parents that are working from home. So it's really difficult to try to do this all online. Many of our elementary schools are really focusing on uh, basically paper packets, sending home books and things of, of that nature, and making sure kids are reading, trying to keep that fundamental love of reading going, providing feedback, uh, contacting kids where they can. But again, it's not timely. It's not like you're in the classroom. From uh, our perception, the equity of resources is becoming more apparent, inequity of resources is becoming more apparent every day. And those resources are not just technological tools, but also human resources, family resources. So many families and children are already saying to us that you're overburdening us, you're putting too much on us. So we need to be mindful of this. Families are in different places as to how much they can, they can handle, what their own bandwidth is in terms of stress. So I also think we need to make sure that we hold children harmless in terms of the future. If they don't advance academically as much as they would have in a, in a direct instruction setting within a school, we need to keep in mind that in some cases, that's not gonna be anything the kid can do about it. We wanna be careful about not inadvertently punishing them for things they have no control over. Uh, we're all trying to do our best to provide students and families as much as we can without, without overloading them. To me and to our organization, the most important thing is getting through this crisis in a way that doesn't make things worse for students and families and that gives them some hope coming out on the other side of this. For us, making sure kids are safe, fed, given some instructional opportunities and experiences and supports is the key to the principals uh, in our association. We can't pretend it's business as usual, but rather we need to provide, again, whatever supports we can, try to help students improve, make sure they don't regress, at the same time, keeping in mind the stress on the family. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier with uh, this committee the other day, and a couple hours ago with Senate Finance, we need to look at cell service and broadband internet access as a fundamental requirement for all of the state in this global economy. Um, all people should have access in this day and age, and for them not to have access is a huge equity barrier and issues uh, that put many children and families at a huge fundamental disadvantage. And the last thing I'll say is that several years ago, I was a superintendent <clears throat> and I was the treasurer of the superintendent's association. That's why Jeff has money in his, in his uh, treasury now. And we had a phone call from our president, <clears throat> who was Brent Kay at the time, the Randolph superintendent. And he was calling us from Peru on his cell phone in the middle of the Andes Mountains. And we could hear him clean his day. And we were in Montpelier and he was calling through to one of our cell phones and our cell phones weren't working as good in Montpelier, Vermont. This is something that Vermont needs to tackle if we're serious about having an opportunity equity wise for everybody in our society. And any questions? I have, I have two, two questions that I, I wanna start with. One is, do you feel like you've got access to AOE in helping to develop these guidelines? Yes, they've been 
We had a meeting yesterday. They were very responsive. We'll see what the final outcome is. Uh, probably, probably coming out tomorrow, I guess. And I thought they were very responsive. And uh, Jeff and Jeff can speak to that as well. But they, I think they're really trying hard to work with us. We understand that the governor uh, and the secretary and other key officials at the AOE had some situations where they had to turn things around in a hurry. And that's part of crisis leadership. Uh, but as we're talking about planning for the future and long term and solidifying planning, we need to make sure that we're part of that process. And, and my understanding from the AOE is that they have every intention of making sure that we are and we appreciate that. That's great. My second one um, is our sister committee, the uh, Technology, Energy and Technology Committee has reached out to, to me uh, in, in regard to um, access to technology, access to broadband. Um, it would be really helpful. I, I did mention this the other day. Um, I don't want to put busy work on the schools, but I'm assuming that you have people that could probably fairly quickly identify where the gaps are um, in, uh, in access to technology. Um, it would be great if, if we could get that information, but I'm also aware that I haven't developed a good question as to, as to it, in relation to getting that, that data. I'm sorry, I'm thinking out loud as I'm going here, which is never wise when you're, when you're online. Um, but in order for us to perhaps have some money to address this problem, if we have an idea as to where the gaps are, <laughs> how it relates to learning. I mean, I, I saw in, in our local paper that at, at our local high school, 95 to 99% of the kids in high school have access. We but heard do they that, really? What? Do they really? your, your principal did a survey of yeah. your students at CBU yeah. the other day, and there was 450 kids that responded to the questions. And then I went and did the math, you got more than 450 kids. So just because I have the internet at home does not necessarily mean I'm always going to constantly respond. My parents might be using the internet. I might not have the connectivity. I might not have a device. And there's lots, lots of places in the state that aren't as fortunate in terms of access as, as Heinsberg and, and that area would be. Secondly, we got 80,000 kids. It, it'd be awful hard to come up with a survey that would really accurately let us know. I've talked to some principals who say, we know that in our system, 10% of the kids don't have access because they've done, they've done little surveys, but there's other systems that have no idea at all. And it also is fluid. Our families that are in the greatest poverty are the families that are most likely to have cell service cut off, lose their internet service, move from one rental place to another, be evicted. So there's, there's all those factors too. I would say in Vermont, probably the vast majority of kids have at least access to some internet, but it's not high speed reliable internet necessarily for all kids. And the kids who need it the most often are the ones that can't get it. Um, I, I don't, I don't have that. I don't have the question or well organized um, at this if point. Do, I'll be glad to put it out and see what we get for a response. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I know that teacher, the teachers, like individual teachers are going to know as they're reaching out to their students, they're going to know who's got access. Right. Um, Representative James, you have a question. Um, just a no, I'll save it for another time. Thanks. Okay. Representative Coopley. No? Anybody else? Okay, well, ha stand by because you might be able to answer other questions that are coming up. Yeah, thank you. I, thank you. Tracy, um, I know that there's a question on the table from, from Caleb, but could you? Right. Yeah, let me just, um, yeah, I'll give my update here. So Tracy yeah. Courier is Executive Director of the Vermont Council of Special Ed Administrators. And again, it is good to see you all. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, again, I'll keep this brief, but I just want to give you a little bit more background since I haven't talked to you yet around this issue. Um, and then just describe some pieces, some guidance that has come out this week and that what we're focused on with regard to the CARES Act. So um, 
obviously special education is always complex and now it's a major issue in this pandemic. Um, we all know over the past few weeks, things have moved quickly and we've been working hard to adjust to the idea that we need to support um, all the children very differently and most notably in a way that's physically distant. Um, and in addition, special education within the context of this new educational paradigm creates significant issues um, in the context of the Individuals with Disabilities Act, IDEA. Um, and so that's just really important to understand as we move forward. Um, I was glad that Erin McGuire could talk to you on Friday. Um, and as she told you, um, the ability to meet the timelines and formal compliance requirements of IDEA is a significant challenge. Um, and it wasn't designed to address implementation of special education in the middle of a crisis. Um, so while we can do IEP meetings on the phone or through a Zoom call, it's far from ideal and evaluating students through a computer or over the phone is next to impossible um, in many situations. And at the same time, we want special educators to be supporting families and connecting with children and not just stuck in that massive amount of IEDA uh, paperwork um, that is required. So the AOE has been working with the field um, to the extent that they're able to, to adjust and flex the expectations, um, which we're really grateful. But as um, you know, um, there's a lot of work on the federal level to address these challenges because uh, these are federal laws. Um, so since the beginning of all of this, um, I've been meeting with the Visbet legal team. So those are um, the three main special ed lawyers um, for school districts. Um, and then also Erin McGuire, um, who, as you know, is a VCSCA member, and she's also currently our national organization's president, um, the case. Um, and so she's been part of that. And then our board president now is Mary Lundine from Montpelier Roxbury. So the, the six of us have been meeting daily, almost daily. Um, and it's been extremely helpful because it helps us do the best thinking together. And then there's consistent messaging to the field, um, which is really helpful because many of the school districts are um, trying to get advice from their their special ed attorneys at the same time, and we want everything to be as consistent as possible. And then our group's been bringing questions and concerns and recommendations to the AOE. So that's been a really helpful communication and feedback and just a good thinking loop. And um, Jackie Kelleher, who's the state director of special education has just been working so hard on all of this from the beginning. Obviously she's been very accessible and she and I have been in good contact. And last week um, we invited both Jackie and Claire O'Shaughnessy from the AOE legal team to join the six of us um, for one of our group meetings. And they're actually gonna join us tomorrow again. And that's just really helpful to have the AOE um, as part of those conversations. And when we did meet last week, um, it resulted in an important piece of guidance that came out on Friday, um, which is um, called IDEA requirements for placement and IEP amendments, because that was just a the pressing issue for the field um, to understand what would be required. So it this what came out is is really helpful and it states that services, not placements may change in the context of the COVID-19 closure. Um, and it provides um, options for school districts to amend IEP service pages in partnerships with families. So this was a real improvement from earlier guidance that had indicated that IEP teams would need to change the placement for every student on an IEP if school closure lasted longer than 10 days. So basically this more helpful and updated guidance says the LEA is not required to redraft the entire IEP, which was a significant concern um, for us. But however, upon the request of the parent, the LEA would be required to incorporate um, the amendments into a revised IEP. So we felt like that made um, the most sense and it really helped and was important for us to have dialogue with AOE around um, why that needed to be um, updated. Um, and so the field, my members, it came out at the end of the day Friday and I think everybody was just very, you know, at least happy to see those pieces. And I think AOE has definitely been working very hard and wanting to collaborate. And I feel like they've done a tremendous amount of 
work and of being very responsive, but it's just hard. And we're trying to really keep an eye on everything that's kind of coming out. Um, for example, just yesterday, they um, released their COVID-19 financial guidance um, and that reflected the earlier thinking about the IEPs. It wasn't updated to the guidance that we had received by the end of the day on um, Friday. So we immediately um, you know, contacted um, Secretary French and he said he would be um, looking at that and we really wanted to flag it. It's important and have them um, update that to reflect uh, what we heard on Friday. So there's just so many pieces of this um, happening quickly. Um, and again, that's why it's been so helpful to have our regular meetings and be watching, um, watching everything. Um, also, I had not seen the new guidance on the special ed independent schools. So I'll look at that and more will definitely be happening on that because um, we're also very concerned about the special ed independent schools. And um, I do know that uh, many districts did agree to honor the contracts through April 6th. And we were also waiting to see um, that guidance. So we're gonna return to this. Um, and so when we talk next week, hopefully we'll um, have um, more information on where that is. But we definitely agree that they're very important partners and that we need a continuum of placements and all of that. So. Um, that's another thing that we're concerned about and we'll be working on. Um, with regard to federal law, so we've been working with our national organization, again, that Aaron's president of the Council of Administrators of Special Education case, um, to ask the federal education department for limited flexibilities only in the specific circumstance, so just COVID-19. So where we are is the CARES Act, um, as passed requires uh, the agency education agency secretary, uh, Betsy DeVos to write a report with information regarding flexibility that might be necessary during the COVID-19 pandemic. And specifically the act states, no later than 30 days after the date of enactment of this act, the secretary shall prepare and submit a report to house and Senate committees with recommendations on additional waivers under the Individual with Disabilities Education Act that the secretary believes are necessary to be enacted into law to provide limited flexibility to states and local education agencies that may that meet the needs of students during the emergency. So the things that we're working on, um, a joint letter of the state, um, the national organization and the state chapters is asking for three areas of temporary and targeted flexibility. So one, the first is around timelines. So that's the 60 day initial evaluation timeline, the annual IEP review timeline, uh, part C to part B transition timelines. Um, so that's the first area where um, second area addresses flexibly around procedures. So IDEA requires several procedures that are meant to ensure collaboration occurs between um, between parents and the local education agency and during the pandemic, we believe that it's still critical and very important, um, but it needs to, may need to look differently um, and require more flexibility to ensure that children's needs are met. So the procedural flexibility um, really um, has an emphasis on local education agencies and parents making good faith efforts um, in light of the situation that we're in. That's really, um, the, the main idea of that. And then fiscal management, um, specifically IDEA requires local education agencies to verify the ma maintenance of financial efforts of LEDs and um, SEAs um, towards special education year to year. So that's the MOE issue. Um, in addition, school districts are required to set aside IDEA funds to address disproportionality. So we are recommending that M M e uh, we're recommending that MOE be waived for the 2019-20 school year, and that unspent proportionate share dollars are carried over to the 2021 um, school year. So those are the specific asks um, around uh, fiscal management um, that we've been concerned about. So we're just uh, we've been working on. Um, this letter and documentation, getting that um, letter and request in today. Um, so we'll know we've got this 30 day uh, timeline is ticking um, and it's a very fluid situation. You know, new ideas are showing up every day and we're working really hard to find ways to meet the needs of the children and comply with legal expectations and just support 
families to the greatest extent possible. So that's the most recent update. And again, we'll, we'll know more next week. And Thank you. MOE is within the current wheelhouse of the sec of Secretary DeVos, I believe, correct? Yep, it is. We, and I know that we will be interested in hearing um, any feedback from you related to the uh, issue brought to us today about the private um, yes, definitely. independent uh, special needs schools. Yes. Schools for children with special needs. Yes. Um, any questions for no, um, going back to Caleb? Yeah, so I don't think I specifically answered your question. That's the most up to date, but why don't do you want to say that one more time and I can. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess that um, it sounded like you, you did answer it in the sense that it sounded like there was some helpful news on Friday and and that um, you're seeing some of that flexibility, mm -hmm. but that I'm still hearing that there are probably uh, waivers left, the MOE issue, uh, or, or maybe things left to come from the from the federal government that are important. I guess that I, as we think about um, funding and budgeting and potential borrowing of, you know, tying back to other conversation about the, the school districts that don't have past budgets yet, just kind of thinking about um, trying to really understand where the liabilities kind of yeah. reside in, in, in this moment. And I know that special ed is a big one. And so, no, I, I feel, updated by, by what you said, but, but, um, but keenly interested for sure, yeah. just uh, in, in these developments, as I know That's we all are. Issues. It's, it's, it's a lot of work, big stuff. So yeah, I'll be glad to be able to update you. And again, I'm, we're working on this Thank you. constantly. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Right. You. Um, we will definitely want to be staying in touch with you even though we're well aware that most of the complexity is at the in the hands of the federal government. Um, so this brings us to the NEA, Jeff and Colin, or just Jeff um, Fannin, I believe. Don't forget to unmute. No, I did. I hit it. Double clicked. Um, hello, and thank you for listening to me today and, and remotely. And, uh, hope you're all well and staying well. So the update from Friday afternoon is not much. I think is is both Jay and and Tracy and Sue or all three Sue said. Um, what is new is uh, two things. I think are important for you to uh, think about or or we're thinking about. I should say uh, we are concerned about the finance, the education finance piece. And I know that uh, you and Ways and Means are taking up a joint committee on Thursday, I think it is. Um, and I think that's important and uh, we'd like to participate in that and, and likely will. Um, I think I mentioned it when I testified Friday afternoon to you folks, but I know I testified in, in Ways and Means on Friday morning about the possibility of extending the July 1 deadline of um, the school board votes. And, and I know that Sue talked about uh, the bill that just got passed and signed into law. That didn't include that provision. And maybe there's a, a chance for that, that idea to be included elsewhere. Worry about the 18 schools that still need to vote on a budget. And uh, in the middle of a health crisis, it's hard to get everybody together to do that and, and be uh, in compliance with the governor's directives to stay apart. So I think there are some uh, responses necessary for the pandemic and how we get school communities to vote on their budgets, the 18 that still need to do that. Um, the thing that's probably most pressing for us the debate from Friday is the uh, cont continuity of learning plans, the CLPs, uh, the template that the agency of education put out on Saturday afternoon, um, led to a flurry of activity and Monday and continues to this day. Um, educators are feeling like 
they need more involvement, more say, more because they're the ones who are actually delivering the the education remotely. So they're trying to get a vo their voices heard, uh, and it, and with varying degrees of success. So I think at the state level, we you know Dan, we met with a group of us met with Dan French yesterday. That was good. Uh, I think he acknowledged that the draft they put out on Saturday was just that, a draft, that they welcomed revisions. Uh, and we'll try to work on that. Um, and I'll let Jeff Francis speak to what they've done because um, I think it's important for you to hear that too. So I applaud Jeff's work in that regard. But it's still a um, uh, an effort for, uh, in crisis management, you want to make decisions quickly, but you also want to base those quick decisions on all the information possible. And that means hearing from those at both ends, the top and the bottom, those who are down in the, in the trenches, if you will, and those at the top. And I think that's where you've got to, you've got to blend uh, a good crisis management decision making. So we're, we're grateful that the secretary heard us yesterday. Uh, there's still work to be done in that template the CLP is going to be a big deal going forward, given all of the internet access issues that you've heard about and know about. Larry O'Connor, by the way, testified on Friday to you folks. Larry's a teacher, special ed teacher in Middlebury, and he talked about the school having only reached, at that point, 50% of the kids. And um, so I think that that is going to become a bigger, bigger, and bigger issue, uh, one of equity and just sheer uh, how do we get the kids? How do we, um, you know, meet them and uh, work with them in any small ways? I think we need to lower our expectations um, for providing true education. This is not a substitute for in-person uh, education that takes place in a classroom. Uh, this is very different. This is about maintaining as best we can, given that we're in a health crisis. And that's the priority is to make sure that everybody's healthy. Uh, and that's the goal, not just for students, but staff and the community at large, really, that's the goal. Um, so those are the issues. The internet access issue is, is significant. And um, I think there are some monies in the, the federal law, the CARES law that just passed. Uh, we're trying to sort out whether that's doable or usable today uh, or soon thereafter. Um, and I think I heard this morning, Mark Peralt said something about four and a half million dollars was available for additional monies were available for internet connectivity issues. So I think that's still being sorted out in the money uh, world. That's about it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, special ed will be an issue as Tracy pointed out. It's, 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 it's thick with issues and equity issues and otherwise. So uh, working on that as well, but happy to answer any questions that you might have. So access to the AOE and helping to develop guidance. Do you feel that you have adequate access in helping to develop this guidance? Yes, I think I do. Yesterday we had our first meeting with the, a group of us did. Um, and I think that's good and we need to do that more. We're gonna meet again on Friday, I think it is at three. Um, and keep that group going. I think it's important for Dan to hear from the wide group segment of groups that were there, school boards, superintendents, principals, special ed directors, um, and that's that's good. But he also needs to hear from us, and and we did, you know, speak up, and and I think he heard us, and uh, we're gonna have another conversation. So it, it's ongoing. I think that's good. Uh, everybody was moving so quickly last week. I think it's good to slow down and take a, a deep breath and understand we're in this for the long haul. This is not going to be solved overnight. I um, reached out to a couple of my pre-K, excuse me, my kindergarten teacher friends and discovered that one of them, it, that you are actually doing a training on um, using the internet for kindergartners that Julie Longchamp is, is teaching. Uh, I think it's tomorrow. I think last I checked, uh, just I chatted with Julie just an hour or so ago. I think we're over 130 signups and that's a, a K to two yeah. group. And so the, the interest is keen. Uh, people are want, they want to do well by these kids. They want to figure out ways to use the internet or online resources for these kids, but 
Um, and so they're desperate for information and, and that's what we're trying to provide them. So we're, you know, in a span of, I think 48 hours, we've got 130 teachers of uh, K through two focused. And that's a pretty impressive. We might be, I think our committee um, might be interested in hearing from someone in the K2, um, how things are going with K2, continuity of learning. I think I'm frozen. Somebody's frozen. But we'll find out and uh, I'll, I'll see if I can't get you somebody to, who would be able to speak to that. That'd be great. Um, Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks, uh, Jeff. Earlier this afternoon, um, we were going over bills that we might try to move on uh, if we're able to. One of them was uh, the sort of small fixes to the Healthcare Negotiation Commission, which I'm sure you, are, it was a Senate bill. Yes. And um, I guess I, I'm just curious to know uh, what level of importance you put on that bill from a timing point of view, if we didn't get to it until next year. Um. Well, I think some of the issues that were, were in, uh, you know, incredibly, uh, we just finished negotiating last uh, November, December, got the arbitrator's decision, uh, and that's effective January 1, 2021. So it's not effective, but we'll be collectively back at the table in the spring of 2021, so a year from now. And some of the changes that we're seeking and, and you know, the VSBA speaks to this, but, you know, largely it was a, they had changes they wanted, we had changes we wanted to the system. If we don't enact it this year, then you're, you may be another whole cycle around where it's, it's not doable. So I think there is some, some sense of urgency, at least I think, to enact that this year uh, and, and work on so that it can, take effect for the next round of bargaining and not wait another round because incredibly that's it's we're already kind of thinking about already getting ready for next next round okay so i think thank you very much timely time is of the essence in some respects certainly thank you representative austin and i would just also say that um we'll probably want to pose the same question to you sue Kuglowski as to the importance of, of that bill from your, your side. And Sarita. Um, Jeff, hi. Hello. Hi. hi. I'm just wondering um, how the general public who may not have children in the schools are being informed that teachers are still working. Because I'm hearing some concerns that they think teachers are now off and thinking that maybe they can lower their budgets a bit um, because of that. I'm just wondering who, how they, either how they're informed or if they should be informed that teachers are teaching remotely now. They're not in the schools, but they are continuing to do planning and instruction. Uh, well, it's a, it's a work in progress. And so we're, we, we do think it's important to show uh, the good work that support staff are doing, feeding the the, uh, the kids uh, and supporting the kids in other ways, as well as the teachers who are now developing uh, remote learning practices. So um, I think, you know, even per the governor's orders, the first week designed to just make ba touch base, make sure kids were safe, healthy, and that's what we're doing. And I think the next phase is actually you know, pivoting to some level of education taking uh -huh. place. And we will certainly get the word out. Folks are doing that work. Now, I can't promise you that people will hear it. Uh -huh. um, but I know VPR had a nice story last week about the work that support staff are doing, feeding children and um, bus drivers doing the work, kitchen help and other folks helping in the kitchen to get that bag lunches prepared and all that. So I think it's um, starting to get word out once we get, we're kind of establishing some moderate level of normalcy. I wouldn't say it's normal, but it's a sense of a new normal. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll start to get the word out that people are actually still working and they very much are. Um, oh, I know they are. I just want everybody to know they are. Yeah. 
we're, we're, it's a work in progress. We're, we are working on it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarita, you had a question for Jay. Do you want to ask that now or do you I, want to wait and get, get to the it, it was Yeah, it was just a follow up again about uh, meal delivery and child care. Like how is, is that getting a little bit more organized or, you know, doable? Uh, so no for Jay, that. right? Yes. All right. Well, thank you. I'm just going to conclude and say thank you very much. I do have to, to go to another meeting. Um, but I'll stay, stick around for a few minutes anyway, and then, then I'm gonna probably have to check out, but thank you very much yeah, for all your work. So in terms of, uh, in terms of meals, I, I think in some places it's getting harder as you've got more people that are uh, not able to come to the school because they might be in a certain age range or they're worried about their own children. But in terms of the childcare provisions, that's been pretty much lifted by the governor. So that's not really something that schools are having to struggle with the extent that they were previously. It's more about the uh, feeding children and stuff. And I think from what I've heard, uh, schools are doing a real good job. I know my wife left, left for school the other morning at 5.30 to go make sandwiches and stuff for kids. And then she followed the bus in her car as the bus was going around making deliveries. I know we had a, bus, a bunch of bus routes that were doing that. So as far as I know, that the food part, I, I think that's something that our systems have done a really good job with how it'll be down the road as people get more people get sick and stuff. That's my worry. But right now, I think that's going quite well. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Last on our list, I believe, is the Superintendents Association. Um, we have. Hi. Yeah, Jeff, and, and, Jeff and Francis and Chelsea's on the line too. Um, thank you all very, very much. Jeff Francis from the Superintendents Association. Um, you got really solid testimony last Friday from the superintendents you had with you. So I won't be redundant with that. I could, they could, you know, they talk about their experience far more effectively than I do. Um, Chair Webb asked about lessons learned and things that were priorities for us right now. Um, one of the lessons that I've learned is that, um, and I talked with Chair Webb about this, the crisis really reveals the challenges and issues associated with any system. And I think what we are seeing, and I know that you've thought about this, is that schools are play a huge role societally in terms of support for kids. Um, and you hear about it in the, in the work of your committee in terms of nutrition, mental health, all forms of supports. But when you close the schools and you affect or see the work staff, the work, the, the staff that serve schools um, affected by a crisis unprecedented and I think all of our histories, um, you come to really have an appreciation for how central the, the role of school systems are. Um, so in that context, one of the things that I'm coming to understand better is that although we all entered the crisis together, we enter it from the positions that we're in. So families that are more disadvantaged um, before the crisis, continue with that disadvantage through the crisis. Um, I also have come to realize that the relationships that we have with all of our partners, everyone with whom we work, um, become, become both more important, I would say, and also more stressed. So I am going to talk about the continuity of learning plan that, that Jeff Fannin spoke of directly. Um, but before I do that, so I would say that in terms of the work of the Superintendents Association, we went through the first two weeks, um, March 13th to the, this past weekend, and it was all crisis response. And you've asked questions about 
meals, and I think schools are doing a great job with meals. You asked about childcare, and the pressure is off the schools on childcare, but I don't know that if it, that it's off in in terms of childcare for emergency service personnel in general. So I've had two calls today from state officials about meetings later this week to talk about that. Um, I had a call from a reporter who wanted to know what schools were doing now that it's become voluntary as opposed to mandatory. I don't have that information yet. But, but those things are indicative of the fact that the pressure of this crisis are going to stay with us, even though we may become more accustomed to the routines to the extent that there are any that we're going to follow in terms of things like working with the legislature and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing that I am thinking about is that we have a 10 week period um, where the goal of the education system is to do its absolute best in terms of educating the children of the state of Vermont in circumstances and conditions that um, they don't have full familiarity with yet. But even after that 10 weeks, and who knows what's gonna happen with regard to the health side of this, we still need to be thinking about how school systems and their partners will prepare for children this summer and what the re-entry of school next year will look like. And along those lines, a, a huge issue that um, that we need to be thinking about, and I'm not sure that we are thinking about yet, but we will, is what ultimately will the funding implications look like? So in a call preliminary to this one that we had yesterday um, with Representative Webb, you know, I brought up the fact that we still have matters like the waiting study um, uh, with us in terms of the importance of public policy. And I made a point which I think is accurate, and that is as the pressure of the health crisis begin to relax, and, uh, and we all hope that it does, other matters of importance are going to creep in, and all of the kinds of issues that we were considering before the crisis are going to be right back with us. So what does that look like? That's just something that, that I'm thinking about and I expect that you are. Um, in terms of the Superintendents Association, um, we have a construct as an association which is reflective of principles that we think uh, should be at the forefront as we navigate this over the course of the next 10 weeks and into the future. And that is first and foremost, health and safety of children, school communities and communities at large. I think we need to be paying very close attention to equity, uh, even though we're gonna have limited resources perhaps in the short term to respond to questions of equity, we need to be paying attention to equity and applying all of our best abilities and resources to making sure that the, the, the kids that are more disadvantaged and the families that um, have, more challenges, get um, proportionate supports um, to the extent that we can provide them. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's important that we work to maintain all of our working relationships. So Jeff talked about the meeting that some of the associations had um, with Secretary French yesterday. Even though we're affectionately referred to as the V's, we're not always on the same page. And the sort of contests that we have um, during a period of normalcy me. <laughs> should be set aside to the extent that they can um, as we navigate this together. Um, we recognize that remote learning does not exclusively mean online learning. And even though there is a lot of attention to connectivity and utilization of technology, as Jay Nichols and others have pointed out, we are not as a place in this state where that re a reliance on um, technology and uh, online utilizations um, can serve everything for a multitude of reasons, which could be an afternoon of testimony in and of itself. Um, we need to pay attention to um, appropriate student growth um, 
and a, accounting for that growth and measurement of that growth, but it's in a context which is different than when children are in schools. Um, and finally, we, we, and I think this is really of tremendous importance, irrespective of where each of us is as individuals with regard to how we're contending with this, we cannot ever lose sight, and I believe you all know, I know you all know this, of just how stressful this, um, this entire endeavor is. And I think it's really a time for um, compassion and thoughtfulness and a recognition that everybody's going to do the best we can, but it's not going to be perfect. Um, now, very, br very briefly, um, along those lines, Jeff Fannin and others talked about the continuity of learning plan. And Jeff asked me to sort of tell the story from the Superintendents Association, and I'll be very brief. Um, the agency is under a directive from the governor to get continuity of learning um, plans in place ASAP. Um, he sent a draft to the superintendents um, on Friday, on, excuse me, on Saturday afternoon. Um, superintendents looked at that and thought that from a contextual standpoint, they could add value to it in terms of clarity and simplification. Um, Chelsea Myers and I worked first Saturday evening and then on um, Sunday with a work group of seven superintendents. Um, at 10 o'clock on Monday morning, we shipped a plan that we thought maintained all the, um, the essential effort of the agency's plan but did it in a manner that was also responsible, but more streamlined and more consumable by the field. Um, at one o'clock yesterday afternoon, um, the associations had a, a meeting with um, Secretary French. We touched upon a bunch of issues, including that, that continuity of learning plan. At 4.30 yesterday afternoon, uh, the superintendents who had been on that work work project to look at that continuity of learning plan, had a meeting with Secretary French. That plan is under uh, ongoing review at the agency today. He's committed, I think, to have more uh, another draft out, um, if not tomorrow, uh, soon. And um, that is the sort of pace that we need to move at and the attention to um, working together that needs to be paid. Jeff Fannin appropriately says, you know, we need to let everybody who's affected participate. Um, and I agree with that, but I also understand that the agency's under immense pressure. Um, we're gonna do the best we can with this, but you asked Jeff Fannin if he thought that, you know, the, the working relationships all around and with the agency are going well right now. And I would, I would, we answer the same way that he did, which is generally yes. So uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Um, Chelsea, did you want to add anything? Hi, Chelsea Myers, BSA for the record. It's really nice to see you all. Um, I think Jeff covered most of it, but I am here to help answer questions, especially if they hear more on the pedagogical um, and practice side of things, so. Are there questions? I just, I think one thing we definitely are seeing is the value of your various associations in helping us um, respond to this, this crisis. And the work that you're doing um, in the communities with the people that are actually uh, implementing. Um, it's, it's been pretty impressive and we appreciate being able to check in with you to actually get an idea about what's happening in our in our communities. Um, Peter Conlon, you had a question. Uh, thanks. I, I also heard some comments um, from superintendent about the continuing of learning plan uh, and which they found to be perhaps overly ambitious. I'm just wondering, Jeff, do you feel like the uh, agency has heard that message? Um, I think Jeff Bannon also said today, we need to lower expectations. 
Um, I guess, do you see that as an, as an outcome of this, as the final draft of that CLP is finished? Yeah, I think that um, Secretary French obviously can speak for himself, but we're, we're, you know, we had a good meeting with him yesterday afternoon. He understood the point, which centered on, you know, trying to um, have a useful and legitimate continuity of learning plan, but do it in a way that um, reflects the understanding of some of those core aspects that we're contending with um, in the field of education and also with um, a, attentiveness to the, you know, those conditions and factors that um, are, are challenging to respond to when all kids are going to school. So we're going to know what the response and reaction is from the AOE. They're in charge of this. But, but I believe that uh, we're on a really good track to get something that people will feel is doable um, and will allow schools to share how they're going to meet the goals for providing education over this time. So. You know, that's a question really for him to answer, not me, but I'm op very optimistic about it. He is going, the secretary is going to be speaking with us on Thursday morning. So um, we, we can save that, that question. Um, I am really uh, pleased to hear, however, that the uh, various associations have good contact um, with the agency as we attempt to work through this really challenging time. Other questions? We've heard so far in terms of things that, that are in our wheelhouse, things that we can do pretty much have to do with um, dealing with the funding that's coming, coming forward, um, setting the tax rates, dealing with uh, the, the, the timing, um, use of the ed fund going forward. Is there anything that you can think of that we can do uh, to, for you, I think we're hearing loud and clear that the school districts are under tremendous stress and a lot of really cool ideas coming out of the citizen legislature is probably not what they're looking for. So. Nicely put, nicely put. <laughs> so nothing else that you can see at this point we can do other than really bearing witness and keeping track of where we're going in the future. I think the equity issues that you bring up are, are, are it's staggering what we're, we're seeing and how we may be using this crisis going forward um, is our opportunity. Right, thanks Representative Webb. I think that those of us who testified this afternoon need to have our ears open when we see something that perhaps could be done to um, assist and the response comes, well, that's in legislation. We had to pick the phone up and call you right away because I'm not saying that legislation should be changed, but if there's ever an issue that's going to require a legislative change and there should be consideration to whether that should happen or not, then we ought to get the conversation started on that just as soon as we can. I don't know of anything like that right this minute. They do come up and when they do I think we ought to talk to you about it. We have various bills that we reviewed this morning too and need to make some decisions um, on, on what we're going to do, what's considered um, important to pass now, what, what can wait, what's critical, um, and then prioritizing that as to what the use of our committee time. So we would um, also appreciate your input. Um, on those, but, but not right now. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, so we are on, on Thursday morning at 10. Um, so far, I know we've got the agency in, correct? Avery, could you just let us know what, what we have so far? 
And thank you also so much, Avery, for, for managing this. Can we all just give a shout out to Avery <laughs> for helping us through this? Thank you. That, that was really nice to see everyone's clapping hands. And see <laughs> um, would you like us to go off YouTube at this point? Yeah.